Mark Biltz, you're the you're the blood moons guy. You really are the discoverer of of something that's become a phenomenon around the whole world. People recognizing that God has given us these heavenly signs for our times. And you know, talking about time, one of the things that you know occurs to me is the fact that the whole world is on a seven-day calendar and has been since God created the world, since Genesis. It's right there in the Bible, seven days in the week. Is that significant that the whole world observes seven days? Is there anything about those seven days that would make the whole world observe it unless it came from the hand of God? Well, I totally agree with you, Joseph, and I'm so good to see you face-to-face here, too. But uh, I really think it's because it is designed by God as the creator of the universe that we're on this. As we had talked about earlier, mankind has been trying to change the seven-day week forever Mm -hmm. and the months and uh, the years. And we realize that this is just set in concrete. This is what God created. And in spite of man's greatest endeavors, they're not able to change it. And and there really have been uh, attempts. Sure. The French Revolution, when they tried to work a 10-day week into their calendar, and uh, I I think other... tyrannies around the world have really attempted to get off God's calendar and at least in terms of the way it's reflected weekly but they haven't been successful every single one of them has failed and you can also look at the fact that if you look at all the languages of the world almost all of them refer to the seventh day as a in a form of Sabbath uh, English is an exception, of course. We've got Saturday. Right. If you look at Spanish, it's El Sabado. And, and that's reflected in, in probably 90% of the languages spoken around the world. So there's still this connection with the seven-day week, not just in terms of what, you know the work week and so forth, sure. but everything. Yeah, it's pretty definitely. amazing. It is, it is. And as you know, there are different calendars that are out there in the world, uh, like the, the Mayan calendar that we know has come to an end and everything is fine. Uh, but you have the Muslim calendar, which is based totally on the moon, mm-hmm. which is why Ramadan will float, you know, from month to month. And then we use the normal solar calendar that we have. Uh, but God said in Genesis 1.14, he created the sun and the moon. For the days and the years. And so if we want to communicate with God or he wants to communicate to us, we need to be on his calendar. Right. But yet now the whole world, ostensibly, is on a 365-day calendar. How did we get off the biblical calendar? Well, that's a great question, Joseph. Uh, well, it happened basically because of anti-Semitism, believe it or not, or replacement theology. Uh, back around, you know, in the 330 A.D., that time period, uh, <clears throat> the emerging Christian church uh, did not want to have to depend on the Jewish people to determine when their sacred holidays were going to fall. And so they went with their own calendar, uh, how they determined when the different events were going to fall. So a lot of it has to do with uh, just the fact that the, the early church wanted to have nothing to do with the Jewish people, and so they created their own calendar. In a, approximately the same time, although there's a lot of you know evolution going on here, what was the abandonment of the Sabbath. And right. The Christian church adopting Sunday as their holy day, and even using force and coercion to get people not observing the Sabbath. Exactly. Uh, What's interesting is you even go back to the time of Hanukkah around 168 BC. One of the things that Antiochus Epiphanes wanted the Jews to stop doing was keeping the calendar. There's always been an attack on the calendar. Uh, And so it's the same thing then. It's just a matter of not wanting to be on that calendar. But I tell you what, from a strategic standpoint, as a businessman, if you're going to meet a client and you agreed that you wanted to meet with them at a certain time on a certain day, wouldn't it be great for your competition to spoil that meeting or to contact one of you to change the day so you'd miss the meeting? <laughs> and so that's, this is the devil's greatest strategy. It even says in Daniel how one of the strategies is to change the times and the seasons. And uh, because God, I mean, I believe you believe in divine appointments. 
But people don't realize they're scheduled. Mm -hmm. God has scheduled divine appointments. And of course, the devil doesn't want us to meet with him on those days. And you mentioned Antiochus Epiphanes, who is, you know, considered to be a predecessor of the Antichrist. Exactly. Who does change times and seasons. So it's a, it's a very deliberate thing. Uh, it, there's a precedent for it in history, and it's going to happen again. But let's get back to this idea of how the whole calendar was, biblical calendar, was subverted. There's an, it actually is a result of Christians' initiative here, which would surprise a lot of people. And, and it, it explains why Christians are not on God's calendar anymore. So expand on that a little bit. Yes, well, it, in, uh, it was like 60 BC or so, Julius Caesar from Rome came out with the Julian calendar. And then, of course, uh, around 330 you know, uh, AD, uh, the church did not like uh, being on the Jewish calendar, them determining when, uh, like, for example, Passover was. And so they came up with their own calendar based on the Julian calendar, the solar calendar of when uh, they wanted it to happen. And then, of course, Pope Gregory later changed it, made a few additions for leap years, and it's now called the Gregorian calendar. Uh, it's a great calendar. It's, it's very mathematical. But it's not the one that God uses. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we need to be on the one that God uses to understand uh, biblical prophecies. I think a lot of Christians don't even understand the, the connection between what they observe as Easter and Passover. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, sure. Uh, in the Gospels, uh, the Lord said, you know, at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. Well, he was doing Passover. And uh, in the New Testament, Paul says we're to remember the Lord's death. Well, a lot of Christians uh, recognize the resurrection, which is there's very honorable, which really is the Jewish feast of first fruits, and he became the first fruits of the resurrection of, of the dead. But the Lord specifically said to keep the Passover. Now, I would think the resurrection, he rises from the dead after he dies. You, you can't rise from the dead until you die. But uh, what's interesting is some years, which is like coming up in a couple of years, uh, because the Christians are on the wrong calendar, they actually celebrate the resurrection a month before he dies. Mm. And so here, uh, Easter is celebrated, uh, I think, in March, but Passover is in April. And so we're, we're totally off the calendar. And I'm all for celebrating the resurrection, but we ought to do it when it happened. And the problem with this, additional problem with this, is the motivation for it. As you mentioned, anti-Semitism in the church. Uh, yes. Talk a, a little bit about that. Yeah. Know. Yeah. It started back uh, actually very early. Do you know I can show you in your Bible where the Apostle John was actually kicked out of the church? Now, that might come as a shock, but I can show Not you. Not me because I've heard you say <laughs> John 3. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The third epistle of John. Uh, there's this guy that um, is taken over. And uh, he's kicked the Apostle John out. He doesn't want any of the Jews to be in the building. And it also says he'll kick out any Gentiles who allow the Jews in. So uh, this started very early. This is one that when I show people in the Bible, they're um, absolutely amazed. It's John, it's, it's third John. Yeah, like six through nine yeah. right in there. Uh, so Christianity has a history of anti-Semitism. And, you know, it, it brings us to the, the point of, and we're going to get to blood moons in sure, just a minute. that's here, fine. But, but I, I want to trace this for people to, to really think about. Um, do you think Jesus came to start a new religion called Christianity? <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, some people look at the word Christ and think it's a last name, like Mary Christ and Joseph Christ and Jesus Christ. But Jesus was born a Jew. He lived as a Jew. He died as a Jew, even above the cross. They call him the king of the Jews. And he was a Jew when he ascended on the 40th day of the counting of the Omer. And he said, I'm coming back the same way I left. So he's coming back as a Jew. And so here we have Jesus who, you know, born, raised, lived, ascended, and returning as a Jew. And that comes as a shock to a lot of people. And I think this is all essential background to really understand. This is the foundation sure. for understanding the blood moons phenomenon, which you have so uh, brilliantly uh, uh, discovered. Um, 
Tell us about that. What is happening in 2014 and 2015 that is so significant, and how did we miss it before? Well, I think we've missed it basically because we're not on the right calendar, so we weren't able to make the connections. But in Genesis 1.14, uh, God said he created the sun and the moon to send signals, and it says that they were for seasons also. But in English, we think of winter, spring, summer, fall. But the Hebrew word is moed, and it refers to the biblical holidays like Passover. And so God created the sun and moon to send signals on his feast days. And so I think we, because the Christianity as a whole doesn't keep the biblical feast days, that's why they didn't make the connection between the eclipses and the feast days. Now you're not expecting Christians to suddenly adopt only the biblical calendar to run their lives. Absolutely not. We need both calendars. We have to have our regular calendar because that's how the business world and how the world runs. But uh, like I said before, when I lived in Garden City, and because it's right on a time zone change, people had to have two clocks, you know, because they could call their neighbor and it'd be an hour <laughs> difference. Right. And so uh, the world, the Christianity as a whole, needs to understand there are two calendars. We need the one we have to operate in this world. But when it comes to God communicating to us, he wants to communicate to us on his calendar. So the church is sort of failing us right now, wouldn't you agree, uh, by, by not learning about the feasts and about the biblical calendar in general, even beyond the feasts, to understand uh, the times we live in. I think so. Uh, you know, Daniel, it says, in the last days, knowledge will be increased. And one of those things is not just scientific knowledge, but biblical knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of re revelation that's taking place in the days that we live in. And I think, uh, well, in Acts 3, I believe, verse 19 through 21, it says Jesus is going to be kept in heaven until the restoration of all things. Well, one of the things that's being restored is the Hebrew language, and what's being restored is an understanding of God's divine appointments. And you're a pioneer in this area, so I'm going to assume and guess that you're getting more interest from uh, normal, regular Christian pastors yes. in, in this teaching. Tell us about that. Sure. We get emails and phone calls from pastors all over the United States, all over the world, saying, wow, this is exciting, this is fantastic. And the thing that we hear not only from pastors, but from Christians worldwide, is we've been robbed. Why haven't we heard this? Why don't we know this? And I see we can't get mad at anybody because you don't know what you don't know. And uh, your teachers and the teachers before them, if they weren't aware, uh, then of course they wouldn't have taught you. And so the initial feeling is they've been robbed. But as people learn this, they get very excited when they're seeing the connections. Now about the blood moons themselves, um, what's gonna, what can we expect to see happen in 2014 and 2015? And how does this relate to the end times prophecies? Sure. I think it's very important because a lot of people accuse me of setting dates. And one thing I want to stress is that I don't control an eclipse. Uh, <laughs> I do not control the Come biblical on, calendar. Sure? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the main focus that I want to have is to the call of a watchman. I think uh, Christians worldwide know they should be watching and praying. And so for me, this is a real wake-up call that God is allowing us to kind of have an advance notice this time, you know, that we need to be watching and praying. And that I think God wants to wake up the body of Christ uh, to the importance of the biblical calendar so, he, so we can have hope and not fear in the coming days.